Hi everyone. A very warm welcome to every one of you to the Brook Breelan building, to all of our church family and all of the friends who have been connecting, or maybe this morning is your first morning. We say hello to you and a massive welcome. You're so, so welcome here. Let us go to the Word of God this morning. And this morning we're going to ask the question, does God speak? Does God speak? Well, let's turn to Genesis chapter 1. Now you would think that first impressions to God are important. If first impressions to me and you are important, that God when revealing himself at the start of the Bible would be massively important to him. And he would try and portray some of the most important things about him at the start of what he reveals to us. And one of the very first things that he reveals about himself to us as we begin to read the scriptures is it says in Genesis and in the first chapter, verse 3, it says, Then God said, he said, right from the start, we're starting to pick up. Here is a God who wants you and me to know I speak, I communicate. I verbalize, I engage, and whenever he speaks, things happen. Let us then see what the first man and woman has to say about this, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The Bible tells us in verse 10 that, that Adam, that, well in verse 9 it says that Jesus asks Adam, where are you? And then it says that Adam replies that I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. I heard your voice. And I think this is important to note. God didn't just speak when things were perfect in the garden. God still spoke even when they had been disobedient. And I thank God for that. Because God often, do you want to know something folks? Sometimes I've heard God speak in most whenever I've actually been not in a great place. Praise God that he is gracious enough to continue to speak. But we have got to listen to what he says. So we see that he wants to reveal about himself that he speaks. We see that the first man and woman uh, record that they heard him speak. And so what does this voice sound like? Well, there is a variety of records in the Bible and verses that tell us that God's voice can sound like many different things. He is not monotone. He's not like that Father Ted episode with the the, the priest who had the very boring voice. That's not how God speaks. Sometimes in movies and that you hear, I am the Lord, and all of this here goes on. God's voice comes in a variety of different ways. In 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah hears a still small voice. Some translations put it as a low whisper. In Mount Sinai, in Exodus 19, Moses heard God speak with a voice like thunder. What a contrast, the low whisper and the loud thunder. Ezekiel 43 verse 2, Ezekiel sees this vision of God of Israel coming from the east. His voice was like the roar of rushing waters and the land was radiant with his glory. It was like the roar of rushing waters. What a God. What a God we serve. And then in When we get to the end of the the Old Testament in the book of Malachi, and then we fast forward into the New Testament, there is a period of 400 years where it appears that God is silent. But then in John chapter 1, we're introduced to John the Baptist. And John the Baptist comes in the scene, and he says in verse 21, I think it is, he says, um, behold, I am, the, I am the voice of one crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. 
I am not the voice, but I'm the voice of one. I want to communicate what God is wanting to communicate to you. So here's God's voice beginning to speak again. Prepare the way of the Lord, the way of the Messiah, the Son of God who would come to save the world. Maybe John chapter 1 and verse 1 is a great analogy that the Bible gives us when giving us a picture and an image of who Jesus was. It says in John chapter 1 verse 1, And in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. <laughs> what a word to use when describing Jesus than to describe him as the Word. How much more explicit can you get than to say that I want to communicate because I am the word. You can't make it any more plain and simple than that. I am a God who communicates and I'm prepared to tell you that I am the word just to let you know that I want to communicate. So we see that God wants to communicate And lastly, in Revelation chapter 14, verse 2, we hear what John sees in his vision, the Isle of Patmos. It tells us that, that he sees a verse or hears a verse from a voice from heaven, like the roar of many waters. There it is again. And like the sound of loud thunder. Listen to this. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing their harps. Wow. This God right at the start of Genesis communicates to us, I am a God who communicates. Then as we read through the scriptures, we recognize that his voice can come in a variety of different ways. Next week, we're going to look at different ways God speaks practically to us. But I wonder, have you ever been watching the television? And uh, maybe you're watching ITV, which is usually English-speaking people. And uh, their accent sounds okay, unless you're with them. (laughs) I'm only joking. If you're English, please don't take any offence. But have you ever been listening and all of a sudden a Northern Irish accent comes on and it's like, oh, that sounds awful. (laughs) I've been there. Or maybe you hear your own voice played back on something and you're like, oh, swallow me up now, ground. (laughs) I want you to know the voice of God is wonderful. The sound of harps, the sound of water flowing, the sound of thunder, the sound of, of a rushing wind, the sound of a still, small voice. He knows how to communicate to you, dear friend. He knows the way to get your attention. And I know this morning he is going to grab your attention because that's who he is and that's his heart, that he would get our attention. And so he speaks and he communicates. And I pray God would give us the urgency to hear afresh his heart, to hear his voice Oh, if there was ever a time that Ireland needs to hear the voice of God, it's now. But the church needs to hear it first. Because how is he wanting to communicate his word to people? It's through his people. God wants to communicate to the world through his people. Take the day of Pentecost as an example. Here's all the followers of Jesus in a room. And uh, they're praying. And uh, they're probably singing and uh, all of that and out on the surrounding streets there is loads of people who are not yet saved they haven't heard maybe the the gospel and the bible tells us that god pours out his holy spirit we call it the day of pentecost when the day of pentecost came they were filled with the spirit and they began through the holy spirit to speak in other tongues in other languages It says they're compelled out onto the streets and as they go out on the streets, they begin to to, to speak these new tongues and these new languages out in the streets and the people on the streets are hearing the gospel in their own language and they are responding and deciding to follow Jesus and are being baptized and added into the church. Listen to me folks this morning. 
God is creative. And God has creative ways of communicating his voice to the surrounding areas. Maybe you think, how on earth could God speak to that person? You're probably the person God wants to speak through. The Bible says if we open our mouths, he will fill it with words. His plan A, his main way to communicate his voice to people is through his word and through his church. Through his church speaking his word. We see that God shows us that he speaks, that there are many different ways that his voice can sound. And I want us to lastly look at a way that he spoke to Abraham. Abraham is such an example of communication with God. Um, I'm going to read Genesis chapter 22 and verse 1 to 2 to us. It should be on the screen as well. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. I want to quickly give you three things and these will be very quick. What we see from God's communication with Abraham in this story that we're going to unpack more next week is firstly that God, God's voice will bring direction but not all the details. He tells him, I want you to go in the direction of Moriah and get to that land and later down the line I will tell you then what mountain to go to. The word of God can often be a direction. God will give a dream or a vision. He will give you something on your heart and it will push you in a direction. It will put the compass of your life in a certain direction. But often when God's voice comes, it may actually leave you with more questions than you had before he spoke. There's been times in my life God has set me either individually or for the church and he's starting to put a new direction in my heart. And I know without any shadow of doubt this is God. But I want him to give me the small print. I want him to give me all of the fine print. But he doesn't. And I think I know why he doesn't for me. Because if he was to show me the end goal of that vision, I think I would try to find a shortcut. If I could see the full picture, I believe I would try to find a shortcut. But you see, the goal for Jesus isn't the destination, it is the journey. Our goal is we want to get to the end. Jesus' goal is to work in us in the journey. And here's Abraham and he sets out in the direction without all of the details and he walks by faith and not by sight here. He is just trusting God. God, I do not have a clue why I am being asked to do this, but I am going to go. And as he is on the way, God is shaping him, molding him and doing something of strengthening his faith in the journey. He is pulling out of Abraham what really is in Abraham's heart. Are you willing to sacrifice the very closest thing to you? The most costly thing to you? Are you willing to give it up for me? You see, the journey is often where God does most of his work. I want to get from A to Z, but God be doing the work and the steps in between. Secondly, we see God's voice does not always deliver a nice message. Just imagine, and we can't even begin to imagine how it must feel for Abraham in these moments, being asked to literally sacrifice his son. In my eyes, I'm like, God, this is too much. Why on earth would you ask him to do this? This is too far. But I want you to know God's voice does not always bring nice messages. Here is a message that I'm sure Abraham didn't want to receive. And we too can receive messages. 
But thirdly, God's voice requires our obedience. And Abraham is such a great example here. He is obedient in the hardest of messages. Go and sacrifice your son. And his words of response is, here I am. Here I am. He is one of six men recorded saying that in the Bible. Jacob in Genesis 31, 11, it says, when God appeared to Jacob in a dream, Jacob said, here I am. Moses in Exodus 3, 4, it says, when Moses heard God call to him from the burning bush, he responded, here I am. And we think about that. That is the response that then led to the, uh, to, to the exodus of a uh, God's people who were enslaved in Egypt. The power and potential in one person who will respond obediently to the voice of God with here I am Lord. We read on in in 1 Samuel 3, 4 that Samuel as a young child hears the voice of God and says multiple times here I am. Isaiah 6 and 8. Isaiah um, it says, or then I heard the Lord asking, whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. Wow. If no one else will go, I will go. Ananias, the only one in the New Testament who's recorded as saying this, these exact words in Acts 9 verse 10. He was asked to go and they lay hands on, on Paul, previously Saul. He has a dramatic uh, encounter with Jesus in the road to Damascus. And he, he's blinded as well. Ananias has to go and lay hands on him. His sight would be recovered. And he would have to tell him some of the things that he would do for the Lord. And Ananias, he responds by saying, here I am. Folks, this morning, we will never get anywhere in our walks with God without obedience to his voice. Do you know, I know that some of you right now are listening to me and God's voice has called you to, he has put a dream within your mind, within your heart. He has called you to something in this season. Maybe he's been calling you to something for many seasons and it is greater than your natural ability. God is calling you to something that you're afraid to walk in because you know that in the eyes of people, in the eyes of the public, even in the eyes of other Christians, it may make you look foolish. You are worried about what will they think, what will they say, what will they do? But yet you know deep down in the heart, in the depths of your heart and spirit, God has called you by your name to do something. He has called you to a people group. He has called you to do something. He has called you to be reconciled to someone. He has called you to a ministry. He has called you to to a neighbor. He has been calling you to exercise that gift that is within you. God has been trying to get your attention for years. But because it is a hard message to receive, because it is a scary a message that his voice has gave because it, there is only a direction and not all of the answers provided yet you're afraid to step into it folks I understand I truly understand folks there are days I wake up and feel Lord I am inadequate to do what I do I don't have a clue at times what I'm doing But Lord, I know the direction you're setting me on and I just ask you to help me to be faithful and to step out. And you know, when you begin to step out of your comfort zone, some preachers say it's then easy. No, it's not. If you step out of your comfort zone, you very easily then step into a new arena, which is fear. But I tell you, if you keep pressing forward, you will get into a season of great victory and great breakthrough. Folks, don't let the lack of details don't lack the, the difficulty of God's delivery and his message 
and, and you know what it's going to cost. You know the radical implications this is going to make to your life. You know that there are people might not talk to you again if you begin to pursue what God has for your life. Folks, but don't let any of those things stop you from being obedient to the voice of God. Would you be willing today to say, I will stand and say, here I am, Lord. Use me for your glory and your purposes. Use me to reach these people. Use me in whatever it is you're calling me to. I don't feel I have enough, but your grace will be sufficient for me. I know, Lord, that you're calling me to greater things than my natural ability. But when I am weak, you will make me strong. I know that this is not of me because I don't even terribly want it. But if this is what you have for me, then let it be, Lord, in my life. If you are not a Christian this morning, as I close right now, you need to give your life to Jesus. The Bible says, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart, as in the days of rebellion. Do not harden your hearts. What does that mean? Don't reject what God is saying. Maybe you, God has been speaking to you for a long time, pulling at your heart. He's doing that because he wants you. He does not want you lost. He wants you found and accepted and brought into the family of God and the greatest journey you could ever embark on. The danger is this, dear friends. How you respond to the voice of God now will determine what the voice of God says to you when you stand before him. If you reject his voice now, he will one day be face to face before you and say to you, depart from me, I never knew you. But if you accept his voice and accept his sacrifice on the cross and give your life to him and accept his forgiveness and his salvation, then he's going to turn around to you on that day that you stand before him, whether you die before he returns or when he returns, and he's going to say to you, well done, good and faithful servant, enter in to the joy of your rest, of my rest. What do you want to hear? And dear Christian, can I ask you, are you being obedient to God's voice? Is there something God has asked of you and you are still living in disobedience? God speaks. I know God is speaking right now. I pray he will give us obedient hearts, that his name would be glorified, that his kingdom would be extended and that he would get free course in our lives, in mine and in yours, for his glory. Does God speak? Yes, he does. Are you being obedient to what he is saying? Amen.